And now it's my privilege to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Kevin Starr. Dr. Starr was the state historian from 1994 to 2004. He's been a long-term tenured professor of California history at USC. He's written so many books on California history, Inventing the Dream and others. He is going to come and talk about how the growth of Southern California and the history of water, the two of them were intertwined and mixed throughout the beginning. Honor and a privilege to have you, Dr. Starr. Please give him a round of applause. Thank you, well, thank you, Mr. Nightlinger. What a nice introduction. I uh, was actually state librarian for 10 years, but if, if they have an office in Sacramento called State Historian where I could just sit at a, de a desk all day and write history, I'd love to take it. <laughs> but I'm sorry I'm not state librarian now because, and I haven't been for about 10 years now, because I could all give you exemptions from your local uh, book overdue book fines. And, <laughs> Ce celebration of, of the event. Well, I was delighted to be uh, ch chosen to give this talk because you can't write the history of California without writing the history of water. Of course, you can't write the history of the human race without uh, writing the history of water. Water is something that's so deep and so powerful, so much part of our uh, life that uh, it reminds me of what the famed sociologist and theorist Marshall McLuhan has observed is that once you are aware of your environment, it is no longer your environment. And it has become rather something outside your environment, something to be uh, analyzed as uh, historicized as a function, a commodity, a process, but not the totality of society itself. And I tend to think that water is like that. And, and the, the, the great vast enterprise of the metropolitan water system is like that. You, obviously, the directors, the employers, the users, the different uh, cities uh, have a, a closer knowledge that the general public turns on the tap and there's the water, isn't it? It's automatic, taking for granted our society. So this is a challenge that any historian, including yours truly this afternoon, faces when asked to comment on the 75th anniversary of the turning on the tap of the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. Because this entity is so vast, so crucial, so overwhelming an achievement of engineering, construction, and management that has become these past 75 years of water delivery not just part of the environment of Southern California, but the first premise of its survival, given the necessity of water to human life itself. The very name given this celebration, Turning on the Tap, suggests how this almost overwhelming achievement, the greatest water delivery system in these United States, perhaps the world, a system to be ranked with the ancient aqueducts of China, the aqueducts of Rome, the aqueduct and dam systems of northern Italy, uh, it can only be envisioned not in statistics, this Metropolitan Water District, or even its history, but in the simple act of turning on the tap. And from that tap, deriving nothing short of, uh, nothing short but of, of life itself. Nothing short of the first and absolutely necessary premise for 21st century society set in the midst of a semi-arid to arid region. When the ancient Hebrews sought to express the ultimate and mysterious power of water, they chose the evocative description of making the desert bloom. When water theorist William Ellsworth Smythe was crusading for scientific irrigation on farms in Southern California in the late 1890s, he called his published manifesto, as well as the movement itself, the conquest of arid America, 1900, taking up this biblical metaphor and applying it to the deliberate creation of Southern California through water engineering. 1911, Southern California novelist Harold Bell Wright publishes The Winning of Barbara Worth. Uh, in 1921, Thorsten Veblen publishes The Engineer and the Price System. Each of these books won a novel of 
irrigating the deserts of Southern California, the other a discussion of engineering in the 20th century. Each of these novel, this novel and this nonfiction book behind the extraordinary efflorescence of engineering talent in the early 1900s uh, in this nation and particularly uh, in this Southern California region. Now, California, as we know, invented itself in the 19th century through water engineering. In Northern California, where there was too much water, the challenge became flood control. In Southern California, where there was not enough water for an emerging society, the question was to bring water to the Southland, both from Northern California and from the mighty Colorado River, the Mississippi of the far west. In each instance, too much water or too little, the equation of water with life and social development was so obvious and yet so profound that it did not require much justification. If you wanted to bring to Southern California, if you wanted to bring Southern California into existence, in short, you would have to do it through water engineering. If you wanted Southern California to bring into uh, existence the new Italy, the new Greece, the new Spain, the new America that Southern California pioneers dreamt of and struggled towards, then water engineering was your priority. Dreamt of and struggled towards in books like Charles Dudley Warner's Our Italy, or Dr. Peter Romandino's The Mediterranean Shores of America, this Mediterranean metaphor of Southern California in terms of climate, in terms of graciousness of life, in terms of distinction of architecture, in terms of splashing fountains in its plaza, the new Mediterranean of American society. This process of invention through water dated back to the early 1770s when the Franciscan Padres of Mission San Diego de Acala constructed a dam, a reservoir, and channel system at Mission Gorge on the San Diego River to irrigate their orchards and farmlands. In the decades to come, Padres at other missions likewise established irrigation systems to water their vineyards, orchards, and gardens, thereby expanding irrigation culture up the El Camino Real coast of California. During the gold rush, the foundations of industrial California were similarly invented through water technology. The discovery of gold by carpenter James Wilson Marshall and his crew on the South Fork of the American River on 24 January 1848 occurred during the construction of a water wheel and tail race intended to provide power for a sawmill. Whether an individual prospector planning for gold in a creek or a crew of gold seekers constructing a dam and aqueduct to divert a stream or the environmentally destructive industrial techniques of hydraulic mining in which high pressure hoses washed away entire hillsides, the fundamental technology of the gold rush depended upon water and the DNA code of California became an interaction of nature and technology, land and water. Tracing this through the Pilaracitas Dam for San Francisco, for the Zanja Madre on Figueroa past the University of Southern California in Los Angeles with a, a young in, aspiring engineer by the name of Mulholland working as a Janjero. In the year 1887, during the boom years of Southern California's following the arrival of the Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe Railroad directly connecting Southern California to the east, a breakthrough occurred when State Senator C.C. C. Wright of Modesto succeeded in passing through the legislature and having the governor sign the Wright Act named in his honor which along with adjusting riparian rights made it legal for farmers to create irrigation districts with authorized power of issuing bonds and constructing cooperative irrigation districts. The Wright Act represents a major breakthrough because at the core of it was the issue of social cooperation on a local or regional level. The Wright Act represented a triumph of localized democracy based on the principle of subsidiarity, which is to say it allowed local irrigation districts to do what was best done on a local level while remaining under state sponsorship. 
through the Right Act, the sovereign state of California took a major step towards the localization of water engineering and delivery. True, in the decades prior to that, the cities enfranchised by the sovereign state of California met their own water needs, but they tended to meet them through private companies. The Right Act, by contrast, empowered local communities to create democratically run districts with governmental and quasi-governmental powers to meet water needs, either for agriculture or for urban development. In the early 20th century, California metropolitanized itself through such vast projects as the Los Angeles Aqueduct completed in 1913, the Hetch Hetchy Dam and distribution system bringing the waters of the Tuolumne River to San Francisco in 1934, and Boulder slash Hoover Dam, the greatest project of them all, whose waters and hydroelectricity were serving Southern California by the late 1930s. In each instance, vision drove the process. Prophetic vision through which Californians beheld the future and made it happen through water engineering. The Franciscan Padres showed vision when they created the first irrigation and domestic water systems to be built by Europeans in the far west. The Mormon settlers arriving at Rancho San Bernardino in June 1851 showed vision when they set up their irrigation and domestic water system and laid out the city of San Bernardino in 1853. The physician William P. Blake exercised vision when in 1855, writing in the fifth volume of Pacific Railroad reports, he suggested that the Colorado desert might one day be irrigated from the Colorado River. And the great John Wesley Powell, who explored that river in the post-Civil War period, showed the same vision and made the same suggestion in his conquest of arid America. State engineer William Hammond Hall exercised a comprehensive vision when in the 1880s he began to produce a series of published studies calling for the integration of all California, north, south, and central, into one irrigation and urban aqueduct system. That, that's 190 years before the completion of anything like that, among other tasks that would bring the waters of the far north to central and southern California. Quite simply then, the Right Act empowered local communities to form irrigation districts that could tax, issue revenue bonds, acquire land by eminent domain, and divert river water to dry lands for irrigation and or flood control. As such, the Right Act served as a model for the creation of municipal water districts in 1911, state and county water districts in 1913, municipal utility and public utility districts in 1921. Now, most surprisingly, in 1923, the Right Act also served as a model for the creation of a multi-county bridge and highway district authorized to span the Golden Gate. And that Golden Gate project and the Metropolitan Water Project proceeding in tandem at the same time have so much in common in terms of cooperation and in, in behind great engineering projects. And in 1928, the Wright Act established the model finally for the creation of the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. As California became more complex, so did the water issues it faced. It was one thing for the Wright Act to authorize the creation of irrigation districts in 1887 when the population of the state was barely approaching the 1.2 million mark. It was quite another challenge, however, to meet the water needs of a growing urban industrial society and an agricultural economy edging into hemispheric status. With the electrification and urbanization of California in the late 19th and early 20th centuries came a growing need for hydroelectricity, which made of water engineering an even more crucial component of growth. The entrance of the federal government into water engineering in the far west with the passage of the Reclamation Act of 1902 further complicated the picture. 
would water in California increasingly pass into federal jurisdiction, it was asked, and if so, how much? Or would state and local control over water be sustained? During the boom years of the 1920s, new and growing industries, the motion picture industry in Southern California, for example, an agricultural industry that was now feeding the nation, an industrialized Los Angeles County and the San Francisco Bay Area coalesced to create for the water community of California a rapidly increasing complexity. Now, but when you put the right act together with the rise of social cooperation in the late 19th and early 20th century, it becomes a major idea and a powerful social force. A major idea and a powerful social force at the core of the Metropolitan Water District. Already by the late 19th and early 20th century, Californians were showing a special talent for social cooperation in the private sector. The citrus growers of Southern California were forming the Southern California Fruit Growers Association in 1895 and the California Fruit Growers Exchange in 1905 that empowered these fruit growers to standardize the cleaning and packing of fruit in jointly owned exchanges and market the product under the trade name Sunkist. As a result, oranges, a luxury item in earlier years, became a commonplace across the nation. The raisin growers of Fresno likewise formed a cooperative, and those of us of a certain age remember the small red packages of sun-made raisins in our school lunch bags. Today, numerous other agricultural cooperatives carry on in California carry on this tradition. But in the 1920s, even bolder visions of social cooperation, this time in the public sector, began to emerge in California, north and south. In 1922, under the leadership of Herbert Hoover, a Colorado River Compact was finalized by the seven states along the Colorado, calling for the joint creation of a great dam and aqueduct system, bringing the waters of the Colorado River to those states and to California. At the same time, the counties ringing San Francisco Bay, together with Del Norte County on the Oregon border, using the Wright Act as their model, formed a voluntary entity to bridge the Golden Gate and succeeded in getting the Golden Gate Bridge and Highway District, formally recognized by the legislature and the governor in mid-January 1923, to start the process that resulted in the completion of the Golden Gate Bridge in 1937. Intercounty cooperation, state approval, financing, construction. The Colorado Compact, meanwhile, agreed upon at the same time that the Golden Gate Bridge project was agreed upon, prompted Southern Californians to look ahead into the future and ask a simple question. How would the water of the great Colorado be delivered to Southern California? To think about Boulder Dam, as the Hoover Dam was then called, was by definition to envision the delivery of the water it impounded and closing that 300 or so mile gap. For, for more than a half a century, Californians have been asking this question in terms of water from the north being brought to the south and water from the Colorado River then being brought to Southern California. In this process, Californians through water through water engineering, envisioned the future, and set about to make that future happen. As I tried to suggest in my book, Material Dreams, the 1920s was a takeoff decade for Southern California, surpassing even the boom of the 1880s that transformed a remote and undeveloped region into a rising society that the American novelist, Henry James, responding to the climate and beauty of Southern California, characterized it as an Italy awaiting its history. Already Los Angeles had temporarily secured its water needs with the opening of the Los Angeles Aqueduct in 1913, when Los Angeles city engineer William Mulholland said simply, there it is, take it. But we must remember that even as the Los Angeles Aqueduct was completed, Mulholland began making plans for an aqueduct to bring the waters of, of the river, Colorado River to Southern California via a Colorado aqueduct, on which construction began in the foothills of the Cowichili Valley, Valley 
on 25 January 1933. Five years earlier, in 1928, the California legislature uh, authorized the creation of a metropolitan water district of Southern California, a cooperative in the public sector with 13 original cities after the adjustments uh, that we, we heard of in the foundation to build and operate the Colorado River Aqueduct. The roll call of these 13 cities, which we saw them, saw them just recently with their uh, picture being taken, the, the roll call of these 13 cities casts a wide net across Southern California history. For these cities differed in size, economies, and origins, although they, they each had one thing in common, finding their communities, in their communities, a lens, a prism in which to envision the future. Many of the original 13 cities, Anaheim, Santa Ana, Fullerton, and Torrance, shared a similar past, mid-19th century origins, agricultural communities in the early 1900s, and in the 1920s, the beginnings of the process of suburbanization. Even Beverly Hills, although a 20th century creation, had consisted of lima bean fields in, the earlier, in its earlier identity. Pasadena, now a center of academic and scientific refinement, began in the 1870s as, a, as the Indiana Orange Grove Association, a cooperative of ranchers and agriculturalists from Indiana before it morphed into a city of choice uh, by the boom of the 1880s. The coastal cities of Santa Monica and Long Beach had deep roots in the Rancho era and had developed as urban resorts in the turn of the 19th and early 20th century. You think of the rise of Southern California where so many great hotels formed the nucleus around which urban uh, uh, tourist-related or visitor-related cities grew, uh, hotels like the Wentworth in Santa Barbara, the Huntington, or the Virginia in Long Beach. Like Glendale, first name Tropico, these were cities being discovered in the 1920s and 30s, not only by suburbanites, thanks to their accessibility via the big red cars, but by artists and writers, Raymond Chandler and James M. Cain come to mind, who found in these communities dramatic instances of the new American culture that was emerging on the South California coast. And of course, even more recently, emergent townships such as Compton, Fullerton, and Torrance, also original founders, had long lived under the shadow of Los Angeles, the most populous of the founders, and could see, all these cities could see in the self-actualization of Los Angeles in the 1920s, uh, thanks to its temporarily adequate water supply, a model for their own uh, development. Uh, th this building, 1939, is one of the last examples of that period of definition. It saw the Los Angeles City Hall, uh, the Los Angeles Public Library, the Biltmore Hotel, the campuses of USC and UCLA, uh, and then this Union Station under construction. Dramatically then, these founding cities of the Metropolitan Water District were envisioning and inventing Southern California through water engineering across gaps of size, wealth, current status. They each believed in the value of their community as a localized place, however large or small, and the value of the Southern California they could create together through the Metropolitan Water District they were organizing. In brief, these communities transcended their differences in pursuit of the common good, a destiny even, but hidden to them, hold, held on to them, they held the cities, did that common good, but they held on to their local identities and their local strengths as they do to this day. In the 1850s, Southern Californians, Mexican-American Californios and Americans alike were committed to Southern California as supporting cattle on a thousand hills. As historian Robert Glass Cleland describes this period anchored in the rancho economies of the Spanish and Mexican eras. In the 1870s, this, Californ this cattle economy yielded to an economy anchored in agriculture that kept its preeminence for the next 80 years. In the 1880s, Americans envisioned Southern California as a cascade of citrus groves moving past agricultural townships in a newly emergent region committed not just to agriculture but to values of civility, 
education, and the genteel tradition. The 1890s witnessed a new vision, the integration of Southern California through streetcar transportation into a coherent region, as well as the rise of a great resort hotels on its coastline. The first two decades of the 20th century reinvented Southern California in this instance, paced by Los Angeles as an aqueduct empire analogous to ancient Rome and its triumphant water engineering. Now in the 1920s, the founding communities of the Metropolitan Water District were envisioning the consolidation of all these identities into an even more impressive future. From today's vantage point, celebrating the arrival of Metropolitan Water, Dist water to Pasadena on 16 June 1941, we should also celebrate the 75 years of expansion and progress that, that followed that first turning of the tap. In this regard, the support extended by the Metropolitan Water District to Proposition 1 in November 1960 is, aside from the founding of the Metropolitan Water District itself in 1928, its next most important milestone. We must remember, remember that Proposition 1 authorizing the state water plan was passed by the voters with a margin of less than 1% because of Northern California versus Southern California differences. Northern California saw the, saw the state water plan primarily in terms of flood control. Southern California envisioned the state water plan as the necessary next step for its continuing viability. In terms of the Northern California, Southern California dynamic, that election was the most divisive in the history of the state. Yet, and here there is a great paradox, the passage of Proposition 1 and the subsequent construction of the state water plan, as well as its integration into the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, has also been the single most powerful force across the past half century in unifying the state of California through water engineering. Now remember, if the Pilgrims had landed in Santa Monica Bay in the 1620s instead of Massachusetts Bay, there might very well have been six or more states within the boundaries of present-day California. Superimpose California on a map of the East Coast, and you see that it runs from Maine to Georgia. At the first constitutional convention held in Monterey in the summer of 1849, the delegates to that convention struggled with the fact that Mexican California contained the present-day states of Arizona, Nevada, Utah, and Southern California within its boundaries. California, in brief, is supersized, a nation state, the eighth largest economy on the planet. But water engineering, as represented by the Metropolitan Water District, its 14 cities and 12 water agencies, in conjunction with the state water plan, which is in turn reinforced by the Federal Bureau of Reclamation projects, here has at long last brought to California an engineering unity in service of its vibrant diversity and ecumenical spirit. From this perspective, over the years, the expansion, diversification, and upgrading of the Metropolitan Water District has helped bring into being California as a society, a global society, as well as an American state. And it continues to do so. The droughts of the 1980s and 1990s, for example, challenged this region to diversify its water supplies through an integrated water resources plan. The ability of the Metropolitan Water District to employ conservation, recycling, and recovery is today equivalent to the building of a second Colorado River aqueduct. In the year 2000, the district completed Diamond Valley Lake, the largest reservoir in Southern California, which secures for this region a six months emergency supply. In times past, say as in the case of Proposition 1 in November 1960, the whole question of water as far as Northern California and Southern California was concerned was a case of either or, winner or loser. The whole question of drought, however, to include the recent entrance of the Colorado River into a semi-millennial period of drought has made a win-lose mentality worse than out of date. It has become something threatening the very future of California itself. No one region of California has the right to declare a water war on any other region. In point of fact, most recently, meaning across the past quarter century, the very opposite mindset has occurred. 
one of operating a truly statewide system for the development of an innovative mix of exchange, transfer, and storage agreements throughout the state and along the Colorado River. In the creation of this new water culture, the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, having the most to lose if the old win-lose system continues, led the way in the formation of this culture of social cooperation and environmental stewardship. The Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, in short, has played an important role in the evolution of a water policy that is once statewide, regional, and local. In times past, water engineering prophesied California and then invented California. In times present, water engineering is reasserting the integrated, interdependent, yet thoroughly regional and local nature of California. Thus, the Metropolitan Water District, so powerfully identified with Southern California, continues to pursue solutions in the San Joaquin, Sacramento Delta that, that balance environmental protection with water supply reliability to the benefit of the entire state, every region of the state, and every local consumer. At the same time, the district is pursuing development of a major water recycling partnership with Los Angeles County sanitation districts that is making even more effective an environmentalism that blends nature and technology to the benefit of society. Here then, as is documented in the magnificent exhibition that many of you now will be able to enjoy, is one of the great engineering products, projects of the planet. And here in Southern California, which over the past half century, supported in significant measure by water engineering, has, has played the major role in recreating California as a global nation state. Turning on the tap is nothing short of being able to turn on the tap of civilization itself. For, that, for without water, we perish. Energized by social cooperation, the social cooperation so powerfully evident in the creation of the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, propelled by a sense of the common good and the comprehensive nature of society, skilled in managing the give and take of negotiations and policy development, animated by an awareness of limits as well as the grand possibilities that lie ahead, we Californians shall be able across the next 75 years to turn on the tap and once again encounter a Southern California that invented and sustained itself through water engineering just as the founders of Southern California dreamed of doing and over time made a gift of that Southern California to each of us. Turning on the tap then, on behalf of integrating our society, on behalf of social cooperation, uh, on behalf of countering those deep divisions that seem to be threatening us these days, pitting one kind of American against another. Turning on the tap, we make a connection with the past, present, and future of Southern California. Water is life, and so is history. The history of all of us together inventing Southern California through water engineering, through the agencies and institutions we create together when we cooperate socially, as we did 75 years ago when we turned on the tap. When we turned on the tap, we brought modern American Southern California into a next phase of integration, of existence, of cooperation and interdependency. Let's keep it that way. Let's keep envisioning the future. Let's look forward to the next 75 years of turning on the tap with the Metropolitan Water District. Thank you. <laughs>